Strong walls, strong men, strong women. Castles were the perfect places to store treasure and keep it safe from prying eyes. For then, as now, treasure was wealth, and wealth was power. Tintagel Castle, on the romantic, rocky and wild coast of Cornwall, is a place with such a brooding air of mystery that if it wasn't already wrapped in legends, we'd have to invent some for it. But have no fear, there are legends aplenty. And if you believe them, they date back to the Dark Ages, to the time of King Arthur, no less. What remains of Tintagel Castle today is only a remnant of its glories in the past. These castle walls were raised by Reginald, the bastard son of Henry I. Reginald was the Earl of Cornwall, and it was surely no accident that he built his castle on this rocky and weather-blown peninsula. A writer at the time describes it thus. The castle is built high above the sea, which surrounds it on all sides, and there is no other way in except by a narrow isthmus of rock. Three armed soldiers could hold it against you, even if you stood there with the whole kingdom of Britain at your side. With all its natural defences, Tintagel was an ideal spot for an up-and-coming earl. And for anybody who was anybody, or who wanted to be somebody, this was a prestigious address. The birthplace of no less a person than King Arthur. Arthur is thought to have been a warlord in the 6th century, and wherever his legend is found, so too is the name of Merlin the Magician. This rock face, they say, bears the eternal mark of his profile, eye, nose, mouth and beard. Merlin is this mysterious character that uh, drifts in and out of the story. Um, apparently there were two Merlins, uh, one in Wales, which is the one more akin to the Arthurian legend, and another one who lived in Cumbria. It's a possibility that, uh, being that there was more than one, uh, that it would have been a title perhaps given uh, to a healer, um, an alchemist, um, uh, a wise man, uh, which Merlin was all of these things. Legend has it that this cave below the castle was once Merlin's lair. It's said that here he concocted a magic love potion for Uther Pendragon, that he might woo the Lady Egraine, wife of Gorlais, the Duke of Cornwall. The flowering of their union was the boy, Arthur. According to some legends, it was here at Tintagel that the young boy king placed his foot in this, Arthur's footprint, and so claimed his place as the rightful King of the Britons. Surely something must remain of that old treasure, that gilded world of enchantment, where magic casements open on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Curiously enough, Tintagel has managed to surprise even the most hardened sceptic. In the 1930s, excavations revealed traces of buildings and pottery dating from the 5th and 6th centuries. The workmanship was of a quality which only a king of the time could have afforded. Then, in 1985, a fire broke out across the island, which revealed patterns of yet more buildings. Tintagel was clearly a place of some importance in the Dark Ages. But still there were no tangible signs of that lost world of Arthur, until, that is, 1998. On the last week of a dig on the eastern slopes of the island, an archaeologist hit on the find of a lifetime. They came across uh, what they classified to be a medieval drain, which had uh, a slate cover on. 
Um, they took the drain apart, and as they were putting it back together again, they were about to put the stone back on top, and somebody turned it over. Um, the inscription contains the name Artognu, which is uh, a Latin version of the name of Arthur, uh, and is perhaps about the first real tangible evidence we've had for um, Arthur's existence here uh, at the castle. It may not be gold or silver, but to those who've been enchanted since childhood by tales of Arthur, a discovery like this is beyond price. It doesn't solve the mystery, but it suggests the mystery of Tintagel Castle is still worth solving. The same can also be said of Rennes-le-Chateau in southern France. Could it be that the castle of Rennes still holds the clue to the mystery of the lost treasure? A treasure that could even have meant death and damnation for all those who handled it? I'm here in Rennes-le-Chateau, in the foothills of the Pyrenees, where there's one of the oldest castles in France, possibly one of the oldest castles in the world, for its foundations date back to the 5th century to the time of the invading Germanic tribes, the Visigoths. The castle was destroyed more than once in its long history. In 1210, when the Catholic Church was wiping out all traces of heresy in these parts, Simon de Montfort, Catholic Enforcer-in-Chief, passed by and left neither castle walls nor heretics standing. It was rebuilt to enjoy a further century of good service before marauding bandits from Catalonia in northern Spain descended on it like a pack of jackals. These men were called routiers and made a dishonest living through robbing, raping and plundering others. But resolute and undaunted, Wren was to rise up a third time. This castle hints at more than one secret. One of its towers bears the strange name of the Alchemist's Tower. Could it be that in centuries past, alchemists actually succeeded in their quest to turn base metal into gold? But that's not the only secret. Tantalizing as these questions are, we might never have asked any of them had it not been for a certain undistinguished priest of this parish. His name was Beranger Sonnier and back in 1885 he was installed by his bishop to have responsibility for the flock in this tranquil setting. He'd been born nearby some 33 years earlier, and he would continue to live and work here until his death. Beranger Saunier knew every nook and cranny, either from personal experience or what he had heard from family and friends in the village. It's also true to say that they knew a great deal about him, but they didn't know everything. It's true that Berenger was devoted to the church at a time when such devotion in France was perhaps unfashionable. Berenger was a staunch royalist, much opposed to the republican views of the French of his day. But whilst he may have hankered for a return to the aristocratic values of the past, where noblemen in their castles ruled communities like this, he himself could barely afford the necessities of life, let alone the luxuries. Nevertheless, within a very short while, he somehow found the financial means to carry out enormous construction work in and around his church and beyond. Then as now, priests could expect few rewards in this world, certainly not financial ones. His stipend was modest. He could afford the services of a housekeeper, the young and beautiful Marie de Nano, and then, to everybody's astonishment, in 1885, this humble parish priest became unaccountably rich. Suddenly, Beranger seemed to have money aplenty. This he spent not only on himself, but on others, treating them to luxury dinners and fine wines. 
One of the great mysteries of Béranger is that at the time of his death, he'd spent millions of francs on renovations and building work around the village. He hadn't obtained this money from his parishioners nor from his bishop, that was for sure. He lavished time and money on this parish church. But not only that, he built a home for priests, he built gardens and a tower. A tower dedicated to the ecstatic memory of St. Mary Magdalene. No wonder that questions were asked about Béranger Saunière. In 1887, Saunière is suspended for preaching reactionary royalist sermons against the Republic. In 1895, there are complaints about his strange activities in the cemetery. Whispers are growing too loud to be ignored. Church and government officials are beginning to ask, what was the source of the funding for Saunier's expensive additions to his church. Béranger Saunier, a fit, popular man, remained an enigma who continued to generously fund his parish until he died in mysterious circumstances. Many are convinced he was poisoned and fingers were pointed at the Vatican. I'm standing by the grave of Béranger Saunier. When he died in 1917, it was no peaceful passing, no tranquil transition of a happy soul from one world to the next. It was widely reported that the young priest who came to hear his final confession was so shocked and distressed by what he heard that he had a nervous breakdown and was unable to work for several months. As a result, he was unable to absolve Sonia or to give him the last rites. So what did Béranger Saunière have to confess? And where did that fabulous wealth come from? And what has it got to do with this castle in Rennes-le-Château? The theories are many and various. Some are patently absurd, others blasphemous. Some facts are undeniable, like this. During the course of his explorations, Sonia came across an ancient gravestone. It belonged to the last countess of this castle. Shortly before she died, she gave her priest some documents and told him a very important family secret. According to legend, the priest hid the coded documents in an old altar pillar where Saunier eventually found them. This may or may not be true, but what is true is that the documents don't seem to exist today. One version of the Rennes -le Chateau story alleges that this could be the very pillar inside which the documents containing the family secret were found by Béranger Saunière. The Countess's strange tombstone may have carried a coded message relating to the mysterious words et in Arcadia ego, an unusual motto that art lovers might just recognize from this Poussin's picture of shepherds in an idyllic setting, contemplating a grave. It means, I too am in Arcadia. The shepherds are probably looking at death itself. Oddly, the landscape of Poussin's picture is strangely reminiscent of the hills of Rennes. Could it be that the picture tells us something Béranger Saunier did not want us to know? Some say Béranger only told the secret to his lovely young housekeeper. If so, she was as trusty a confidant as he, for that secret followed her to the grave.
death and damnation with a lot of anyone who got too near to our next castle, Wevelsburg, philosophical epicenter of Nazi Germany. It's situated near Dortmund in the region of Westphalia, the old land of the Saxons. Had the course of World War II turned out differently, Wevelsburg would have been at the heart of a European empire controlled by the Nazis. It was originally built in the early 1600s as a second home for the Bishop of Paderborn. In its time, Wevelsburg has witnessed scenes of utter terror and housed treasure beyond dreams. In its early days, under the direction of the Bishops of Paderborn, the castle was an interrogation centre against the major threat of the day, witches. This was a time of mass persecution, when unfortunate women were dragged into the castle on suspicion of consorting with the devil. Here in the witch's cellar, under duress, they might confess to the most fantastic crimes of unspeakable depravity. Crimes of which they were wholly innocent, but in those pious days, carried but one penalty, death. How fitting that 300 years later, when yet again mass hysteria visited this land, a mild-mannered chicken farmer should chance upon the place. His name was Heinrich Himmler. Podgy and bespectacled, Himmler had the air of a small-town schoolmaster, but there was nothing small about his ambitions once Hitler had placed him in charge of the SS. It was a long way from poultry farming, but there were certain similarities. As a poultry farmer, he tried to breed the best livestock. As commander of the SS, he tried to breed the very finest quality of man. The SS were to be the racial elite of German manhood, sworn to an heroic oath of unquestioning loyalty to Hitler and to Germany. Himmler wanted to turn the SS from a military organization into a fanatical religious cult. To do that, he needed a suitable schoolhouse. Wevelsburg was to become a kind of treasure house of pure Aryan blood and pure Aryan ideals. Himmler loved Wevelsburg from the moment he saw it. He convinced himself this was a place of destiny for the German people and dreamed up some far-fetched mythological notions to attach to it. The castle had originally been covered in render, which Himmler removed, believing the bare stone walls made it look more like a knight's castle. Even the shape had a mystical significance for Himmler. Well, the castle is triangular in shape, so that is very special. We don't have any triangular castles in Europe anymore. This was the last one. Um, and also Himmler thought that this region was a central Germanic region where central activities of the ancient Germans would have taken place. So with all due attention to business etiquette, Himmler set about acquiring the castle at little or no cost. He wrote, I intend to complete the construction of Wevelsburg Castle in Westphalia as a Reich's leader's school of the SS and apply for the maximum permissible Reich grant to finance the cost of completing the work. I wish to point out that the work will have the effect of reviving employment opportunities in the district and in using the castle for the purposes of accommodation it will be to the great advantage of the parish of Wevelsburg. And so, with voluntary and later on forced labour, Himmler set about turning Wevelsburg into a mystical academy for his racial elite. If the villagers of Wevelsburg had any misgivings about their new neighbours, they kept them quiet, on pain of death. The SS tried to placate them by building a new community centre in place of the castle's banqueting hall, which the villagers had previously used for celebrating festivals but the SS expected the new hall to be used to celebrate pagan festivals. For the devout Catholic villagers, the writing was on the wall. The burgeoning ambitions of the Third Reich were mirrored in the plans for Wevelsburg and the development of the surrounding area. 
The castle's north tower was to be the inner sanctum of the SS elite. Its dingy cellar was converted into this grand mausoleum, a kind of Valhalla for the revered heroes of the SS. The building work was carried out by slave labor from a concentration camp set up nearby. The workers had to lower the floor 30 feet by digging down through solid rock. Thousands perished in the process. No one knows the full extent of Himmler's plans, but we do know that the SS were intoxicated with their vision of a blissful medieval past, a time when men were heroes, and heroes had a fitting place. This room above the mausoleum was a meeting hall for chief officers, filled with marble. It was also planned to be full of symbolic content, from the numbers of pillars, windows and arches, to arcane visual devices. For to the Nazis, these ancient symbols from folk tradition were the true treasures of Germany. But these metaphorical treasures were not the only ones to adorn Wevelsberg. The Nazis were avid collectors of artworks, but they were not so enthusiastic about paying for them. From 1934 onwards, the castle became a repository for plundered art treasures from all over the world. At the height of the war, no effort was spared in improving the place. The SS regarded it as their own Camelot, where a new round table of stout-hearted knights would fight off all threats to racial purity. But the tide of history turned against the Nazis, and by the end of the war, with Allied troops surrounding the town, the SS put the castle to the torch. However, their efforts to obliterate the memory of the place and the thousands of innocent people who suffered here failed. For the Nazis, the price of treasure was indeed death and damnation. Fortunately for us, their warped vision was never to be realized. Although plans were made to develop Wevelsberg and its surrounds into an entire city, they were never to reach fruition. And the treasures of Wevelsberg Castle, the pure blood and the plundered booty, were scattered like corn to the four quarters of the earth.